And as I was running across the field, one of the German armored cars came around the corner of the village and sprayed the uh, field with machine gun fire. I didn't get hit the first time, uh, but when I got up to go again, I got hit in both legs with machine gun bullets. My name is Victor Fuente Alba, and this is my story. I was born in Baltimore on September 1st, 1922. And uh, I am fortunate in that uh, I'm in relatively good health, except for a problem with my knees. And uh, I'm able to uh, lead a uh, normal, regular life, just as I have for the prior years, during the prior years. I was born and raised in Baltimore uh, in an area that uh, had the marble steps that part of Baltimore is known for and uh, went to uh, local Catholic schools in Baltimore and uh, eventually went to Johns Hopkins University where I was in the ROTC for two years uh, before I enlisted in the service. Went overseas with the 84th Infantry Division and uh, was wounded uh, three weeks before the war ended uh, in Europe. And at the time that I was wounded, I was captured by the uh, Germans and released the following day when the 102nd Division uh, came upon us. But my time overseas was with the 84th Infantry Division. The training was typical for everybody, uh, the basic training that, that you went through. Uh, you had to... Uh, crawl through across a field where they they were using live ammunition and with machine guns uh, firing and to make sure that you didn't pick up your head or get up you you had to go through the course from one end to the other in the past you had your marksmanship courses and things like that you had uh, all types of long marshes at night and different training, all kinds of training like that. But that was typical of all of the Army units, you know. We went to New Jersey, and we shipped out from New Jersey and uh, went to Scotland. And then we were taken by train uh, from Scotland to England and uh, went through some training in England before we crossed the British Channel to uh, France. Uh, we, when we got, when we arrived in France, uh, the invasion had already taken place. Uh, so I was simply getting off the ship, you know, and there, were, there was no fighting right there because it had already been taken care of. Uh, but what was uh, interesting was uh, before I enlisted in the service when I was working as a musician in Baltimore, one of the ships that I worked on in Baltimore as a musician was, the, was uh, a fleet of ships called the Old Bay Line which would run boats from Baltimore to Norfolk on uh, overnight boats, and particularly on the weekend. And one of those ships that I worked on was called the President Warfield. And when we were, when my division was arriving in France, when we were in the harbor, I was amazed to see the President Warfield anchored 
outside of the harbor. And I found out later that uh, the government had taken the ship over, boarded it up, towed it across the ocean to use in France. And that was the same boat that I used to work on as a musician in Baltimore. So that, I thought that was really unusual. And that's also the same ship that transported a lot of Jewish refugees into Israel uh, after the war. And when we were overseas, we spent most of our time work, working with the medics, uh, with the uh, who, treating what they then called combat fatigue, uh, which were troops that were sent back from the front lines because of the mental problems caused by the exposure to combat. And uh, uh, that, that's what I was doing for the most part while we were overseas. Well, so the symptoms were that it's almost like they had a nervous breakdown. Uh, they, they, they just lost control of their emotions and uh, were in a stage where they couldn't fight uh, because they didn't have the capability of doing it. Their minds wouldn't let them. Uh, they, were sad, they were sad cases uh, because I knew some of these uh, troops personally uh, before they uh, came back with combat fatigue. And the difference was, that was remarkable uh, of how their emotions had affected, been affected by the war, you know. I think it's a combination uh, of, 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 of everything. The pressure of combat, the, the dangers of combat, and uh, seeing your, your, your friends getting wounded and killed, uh, I think that, that's what probably brings it on, you know. We were in Krefeld, Germany, uh, and the uh, other American divisions were preparing to cross the Rhine River. And uh, we left in a convoy from Krefeld on this particular morning uh, which was actually uh, April the 14th. And uh, as we were going and going through one of the German villages, uh, the convoy was attacked by the, uh, the Germans. We didn't know where they were coming from because you couldn't see where they were coming from. Uh, and everybody got out of the vehicles and some of them, some of the guys went forward to get away and a couple of us, including myself, stayed to determine where the Germans were and how many Germans there were and whether or not we had to fight them or whether we would be able to uh, uh, also uh, get away. So one of the troops from headquarters come to and myself, went into one of the houses, went upstairs into the bathroom and looked out the back window to see where the Germans were coming from him, all we could see, the town was on our left and it was a forest on in front of us. And then we saw the fact that the Germans had armored vehicles that were coming down the street. So we figured we better get out of there before they came into the town. So we went back downstairs to the street, went to the area where the forest was and started to cut across this field to reach the woods. Figured if we got to the woods, we'd be safe there. And as I was running across the field, one of the German armored cars came around the corner of the village and sprayed 
the uh, field with machine gun fire. I didn't get hit the first time, uh, but when I got up to go again, I got hit in both legs with machine gun bullets and uh, naturally collapsed uh, on the field. Uh, the Germans had captured some Americans already, so they had some of the Americans that were captured pick me up and put me on a truck. And then they took me and some other prisoners uh, in the truck into the village and uh, put me into one of the, uh, a house, I don't recall what type of house it was, uh, but they just left me there and uh, they had other prisoners also in the house and uh, they wanted to negotiate with the Americans that were captured. So there was a lieutenant that was the ranking officer who had been captured. So they dealt with him. He did not speak any German. I had a knowledge of some German because my mother was German. I had spent three months when I was a child in Germany, so I could speak fairly fluent German. And uh, the Germans explained that uh, they knew that the war was almost over, but there was a camp in the town uh, that was full of Russian displaced persons. And they were afraid that if they left the town and the Russians were freed, they would probably rape the women and uh, damage the town. So they agreed to give the lieutenant a pistol and he agreed that he would make sure that the Russians would not be left out of that camp until the American division behind us, the 102nd Division, came up and rescued us. So they left us there with that deal. The Germans left us there that night. The 102nd Division uh, fired some artillery shells into the town, uh, not realizing that the Germans had already left. But the next morning, when the 102nd Division came up, uh, they found out what had happened. They took over, they sent me to an aid station where I was uh, operated on. And uh, later, I was, later in, I guess about a week later, I was flown by plane uh, from uh, Germany to uh, England to London uh, to be treated there and over there for my injuries. Uh, but uh, the, uh, it all worked out. The uh, Russians were not released from the camp until the 102nd Division got there. And uh, I was eventually, as I say, flown to uh, England and treated over there. I was hit, uh, the left leg was hit in the femur, uh, and uh, the bullet not only fractured the femur, but uh, damaged the sciatic nerve uh, at the same time. The uh, other wound to my right leg was behind uh, the knee, my, uh, just above my knee, uh, uh, behind in the rear part of my leg. Uh, so the most serious injury was to the left leg uh, because of the fact that my, not only was the fever uh, shattered by the bullet, uh, but also uh, the sciatic nerve was damaged, which paralyzed my left leg from the knee down. Well, uh, because it hit the sciatic nerve, I can say that I've never experienced pain of that severity before or after. Uh, 
it, it was indescribable, describable how serious it felt uh, when when you hit a nerve, you know, uh, and and then particularly the sciatic nerve, which is the the nerve that controls your whole leg, you know. So it was very, very, very excruciating pain. But the remarkable thing was I did not get any medical treatment for about 24 hours or more. I was concerned that I might be bleeding, might, might bleed to death overnight. But apparently uh, it wasn't, I wasn't bleeding that badly. I don't know how I survived it, but I did, you know. In fact, speaking of blood, when they uh, operated on me at the field hospital, uh, they were giving me a transfusion of blood, and uh, I broke out in hives because I was allergic to the uh, blood. And uh, un un unfortunately, they had to stop giving me the blood uh, because they were afraid it was that I it was having an adverse. I was having an adverse reaction to it, but they continued the surgery anyway. I had some German money in my pocket that we had picked up somewhere along the line. And I had heard that uh, if they found you with any German money, they would shoot you. So wh while I was lying there, I, I reached in my pocket and took out the German money and buried it in the ground. Uh, so I didn't have it on me when they came and picked me up. They, they, the Germans did wrap my leg with bandage, my left leg, uh, but that was the extent of it. Uh, so the fact that I wasn't getting any treatment uh, for, for almost about 24 hours uh, worried me, you know. Tanks that had been destroyed, and uh, other damage that had been done by the, the fighting that was going on. But uh, there was, uh, the, the, it was not unusual to see Germans everywhere, you know. Towns and villages were, some of them were totally destroyed uh, by, em, by the em, en, en, enemy uh, gunfire and uh, artillery shells, you know. And, uh, it was it was not not uncommon to see the dead Germans all over the the streets as we went through the the towns, you know, uh, after they had fought to take over the town. Well, what happened was when I uh, arrived uh, at the hospital in uh, England. I told them the story of what had happened, and as a result, uh, I was interviewed by sub civilian uh, before I was sent home, sent back to the States. Uh, they wanted to know uh, if I had tried to escape, if I had uh, followed the protocol that you're supposed to follow while you were a prisoner of war and things of that nature. And I told them it wasn't even 24 hours. What difference does it make, you know? But I had to go through it. So it resulted in me being one of the last persons to be sent home from that hospital because they checked everything out first before they let me go. Pardon? What life advice would you like to give to future generations. Accept life as it is and make the best effort of what you like to do. Uh, and I, for example, was the f first Latino ever elected president of the Musicians' Union. Uh, and uh, I'm proud of my heritage, and uh, it has not been a hindrance. It's actually, it's actually I think, has helped me, you know. But uh, 
and uh, you have to accept life as it is, and as the old saying is, go with the flow, you know? What, what kind of man do you want people to always think of you as? Your friends and your family? Well, I, I think uh, as far as my dealings with uh, other people, uh, I feel that, uh, first of all, I accept people for not who they are, but just what they are. Uh, I have never discriminated against anybody because I don't accept people because of their nationality or color. Uh, I've always accepted people the way they treat me. You treat me fine, I'll treat you fine, you know. And uh, I have tried to practice that in, in everything that I do. And uh, if it's a, the garbage man, if he's a, if I think he's friendly, I'll be friendly with the garbage man. The fact that he's a garbage man doesn't mean anything to me. Uh, it's who the person is, and that's been my philosophy, and I think that uh, that helped me in, in my career, uh, particularly uh, uh, running for office in the VFW and treating people the way I feel they should, should, should be treated, you know. You often wonder whether you made the right move during certain periods of your life. Uh, for example, uh, had I flunked the eye test, I would probably have been accepted on limited service and I probably would have never gone overseas. But you don't know. And then I look at the other side of the coin, where I reach 100, despite all of that happened to me. And you figure, well, maybe I didn't make the wrong move. Maybe I didn't make the right move. A boy that lived two doors from me got killed his first day in action. Um, and uh, the fact was that the, the war affected everybody. Uh, if you weren't working, if you weren't working in, in a defense plant, you were in a service, uh, and every family was affected. You had things, you had rationing, as, as I believe I mentioned earlier. You couldn't get butter, you couldn't get uh, meat, you couldn't get gas, couldn't get tires, you couldn't buy a car. Uh, Everybody was affected in some way. Well, I thank you so much for all your time and your patience. Uh, and I appreciate your service, sir. I, I truly do. And I just want you to know, you know, God bless you, that you've helped more people than you'll ever know. People like me get a chance to live a full and a free life because of your generation. Mm. And so I, I'm eternally grateful for that. And... And I just thank you for sharing your stories with me. Okay. Hi, everyone. The, this is Rishi Sharma. I'm the one who interviews all the World War II veterans. Today, I'm privileged to be with uh, World War II hero Jack Moran. And I just want to ask you, whoever's watching, please consider supporting my efforts to document the World War II veterans it costs a lot of money to travel and meet the veterans and, and videotape them and get the interviews edited. And any donations go towards getting these heroes preserved forever. I'm a combat veteran of World War II, fought in, in Europe with George Patton. Uh, it'd be great if you people, many of you would help support Richie's work. He's done a great job for several years. He's one of the few people really keeping alive the memory of all the people who died with me, protecting 
everybody's rights and protecting our, our democracy. Uh, if anybody, if you could help, that would be just most appreciated. And uh, he'll continue to do this great work, and and uh, you'll be you'll, you'll be helping, impressing a, gr a great number of people and getting them to know about the sacrifices that were made to, to, to keep this country safe. So please, please, please help. Absolutely. Thank you for saying mm -hmm. that, sir. People like Jack Moran deserve to live forever. And with your help, he can. These stories will go on for eternity, educating future generations about the true sacrifices made by a bunch of young kids who are willing to put their lives on the line so we wouldn't have to. Amen. And God bless the World War II veterans.